Hello, everyone. We're um, we're starting back here in our 2023-2024 school year. Um, this is Shifted Ed, so podcast looking at um, the shifts in education over the last little while. They've been accelerated, and today I have uh, Lance Eaton, who's coming in via Rhode Island, uh, to talk to us a little bit about education, the shifting, and in particular, AI and its influence on um, how it's kind of influenced our our practice. Uh, so welcome, Lance. Thank you for having me, Chris. Yeah, I'm so glad that we were able to connect them. Just kind of looking at, at what you've been talking about online, um, maybe we could rewind a little bit and just kind of, this this podcast came out of wanting to connect with people when the pandemic was going on. Mm. So, and 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 we kind of have always kind of touched on that is, how do you feel that education has been influenced by that pandemic and kind of a pre-pandemic and post-pandemic and how you feel that shift um, has rolled out for you guys? Yeah, thank you for that that question. I think there's like there's this interesting mix of both what I would consider pro and more challenging considerations about like what has happened. I think first is just the recognition that uh, online learning is real, which is to say like prior to the pandemic, there was still a lot of resistance. I think there's less of that now. Um, I think there's also recognizing, and this is something at my institution, I wasn't there at the time, but as they emerged out from the pandemic was just like, wait a minute, like, given what our structure is like, we can do synchronous courses via Zoom and that be a thing that can allow us like and help our students have like one less thing they have to navigate being like getting to and from campus and like longer nights and, you know, at, at other places and stuff like that. So I think there there's ways it really helped with that. It, there's ways I think the conversation around like mental health and load and recognizing just like the complexity of people's lives when you are actually seeing like they may not have a room that they can you know i think about our students who like come from a wide range of backgrounds but like we have a lot of students who are you know financially struggling and so like they may not have the private space to do you know to to be that like a, that like idealized version of like what it means to learn in college of like you have yeah. this dedicated space and you're not interrupted it's like no they have complex lives so i think mm -hmm. that came out in a better understanding and respect for that that i don't think was there nearly as much um i think on the yeah. other side you know there's the some of what we saw and, and this will also tap into ai is like the increase of like well there's now ways we can better surveil students and like sometimes it's in like it's sometimes offered as a means of like really trying to support and guide and like make sure we're catching some of the the cues and signals of things that may not be working well but you know any tool that does that is also very easily leveraged into a surveillance into a punishment tool and that that's always like a concern right. um for me because again students won't have often have choices in in these tools um, right. so i think it's that and then i think there's just some really challenging pieces about like the deep desire to go back as i've seen at many different institutions and like completely disregard what we've learned completely disregard like the ways education is made accessible in these online mm -hmm. in hybrid environment in these online being sorry asynchronous and synchronous environments mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. And I think that that's a for me a problem because now we're just going to close the door on students who may not be able to get to campuses um, and may want live interaction, but it's like you either have to come face to face or you, you can't at all. Um, so those are some of the things that I see. Um, those discussions are still rich, and we're still trying to figure that out. Absolutely, and I like what you just mentioned there that these discussions are ongoing, right? I mean, we're it's a continual shift. So it's always this kind of reassessing, relearning mm -hmm. <laughs> that, that is taking place. Let me ask you is, um, what was your first exposure to AI in your, in your educational setting? Like what were the first encounters that you had uh, with artificial intelligence? Uh, I started to see it probably in like courseware stuff. Um, I don't really use courseware in my courses. Cause again, I have, 
I often use like open educational resources. I'm often like using open pedagogy where we're creating and curating ourselves, but like in publishers offering textbooks, like trying to like, oh, like we can have AI do this tool or that tool. Um, I've seen it, you know, a lot of colleges using chatbots um, prior to, you know, up up through the pandemic and, and prior to that as a means of like triaging student help and support. Um, and then, you know, I've started to see it again, just around the pandemic around, well, a lot of the, so when we're talking about AI, there's like AI in general, and then there's generative AI, which is like the moment we're seeing right now, but there was still, you know, a lot of AI tools in and around things like, um, the different surveillance tools for proctoring, mm -hmm. right? E-proctoring, mm -hmm. things like that, that, that was running on AI or like when we're in right. zoom and we have you know, these different backgrounds and stuff. Um, so it's like, there's that more in the generative sense. I think I've seen it um, probably, again, starting in and around the pandemic around ways of like improving feedback or like mm -hmm. improving writing. I mean, uh, Grammarly to a certain degree is is doing things like that. And we're often encouraging students to do that. Um, mm -hmm. So I think I've seen bits and pieces of it, but I think the the arrival of ChatGPT just felt like the it was the catalyst for so much more that people are both understanding and willing to like try out. Right, for sure. It's like we're on this tipping point, right? Where you know when the printing press came in and you know <laughs> computers first came in, uh, iPhones came in, like these tipping points where technology kind of shifts the way that we kind of perceive things what was your biggest surprise about ai in in your field when you when you first were starting to like i mean it seemed like it just blew up last year right at the end of kind of mm. the school year and there was a lot of talk about it what was your surprising moments about it or your aha moments about ai and how it could be harnessed for the good of education yeah i i mean i think my my first, like, it was kind of a surprise, but then I was just like, no, not really. It was just like the knee jerk reaction about the whole, like, cheating, plagiarism, how are, you know, academic honesty, how we ever want to frame that whole discussion of like how quickly it jumped to that when, like, it just, like, it felt like we didn't learn anything in the pandemic uh, in the sense of just like how quickly people were to, like, and I understand it comes from a place of fear and a place of angst and mm -hmm. a place of like so many things changing. Uh, but right. how quickly people were to, to stamp down on that. I think the more aha moments I had, they came, I think the first aha moment was um, when at my institution, this is last December. So ChatGPT mm -hmm. had only been out for a few weeks. Uh, mm -hmm. My colleague, Autumn Keynes, who has been a great collaborator and, and thinker in this, and she teaches at uh, College Unbound. She reached mm -hmm. out to me with a saying, like, I think a student might have used it. Mm -hmm. And so we had to have, like, we had this conversation and she was super helpful in, like, trying to think through, like, first of all, like, when you look at most policies, like, there's no clarity. Uh, you know, people talk about, oh, well, there's an academic honesty. Well, that, uh, when you look at your academic honesty policies, they're often grounded in you bought a paper from somebody else, you know, somebody else did it, or you bought a paper from a paper mill, and this doesn't fit into those categories. So, like, on the technical level, like, yes, yeah, spirit of the law, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but it doesn't really, like, we didn't have grounds for that. But it was more important to think about why. Um, and also that we could be wrong. So at the time, the only real thing to check, uh, the only thing real thing to try to figure out or, or fi if something was generated by AI was like Hugging Face had a version that you could like, was this generated by AI, but it was on an older version. Hmm. And so like the thing that popped into my head in that moment or in that discussion is like, we are not going like, it's different from other forms where it's like, oh, look, your wording is almost exactly the same as this wording thing that exists. And we, we're no longer dealing with that. We're dealing with the probability. And so there was just this aha moment of like, we've got to think about this differently because we are going to falsely accuse students who are going to have to defend themselves against the probability of a black box they don't understand. Right. Right. And like that, that was like the cataclysm for me to at our institution, like I came up with a temporary policy and 
it's starting in, in January, like I launched a course AI and education, where it's me and students learning more about AI as it was changing every day. Right. And thinking about policy, thinking about education, and we actually crafted uh, usage policy for students and faculty at our school in, in session mm -hmm. one. And then we piloted it in session two so students would try it, like try to test out the policy with assignments in their other courses. Okay. And then we had faculty give feedback on it and we're launching it as like our guidelines for the, the fall semester. Cool. And that, that felt really important in terms of like doing this in a way that engaged students. Um, so that was the second piece. And the third one was just in that classroom with students, seeing how they were using it to help mm -hmm. them. Um, I had mm -hmm. a student, you know, this, there was this great moment where I had a student who was just like, yeah, I took my notes and I put it in there, put it into ChatGPT, and it helped me organize them. And she was mm -hmm. like, I, I'm never going to do this on my own. Like, I, like, I, like, the person is in their 30s, like, I know who I am. Like, mm -hmm. like, I'm not going to do that. And so I have the notes organized, and now that sets me up to write a better paper or do a better okay. assignment or better work. That's a cool, cool example. Yeah. And, and your policy, because I do know a lot of, um, School school boards. I mean, we're school boards up here in Canada. Um, they're 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 crafting these policies now, right? And it seems like it's a it's a it's a patchwork, right? Every institution kind of has different things and different levels of tolerance. Um, what can you explain a little bit about how you what policies you guys are implementing and and maybe a little bit of the mindset behind it? Yeah. So the, the first thing we wanted to make sure, you know, at our college is like, we wanted to make sure we still recognize the academic freedom of the instructor and that we couldn't create something that like everybody had to adhere to like 100% because it's going to like how they use the tool is going to vary from class to class. So like that was a thing we had to keep in mind. And so we made that allowment, you know, that allowment, like one of the first things is like, yes, this is the policy in general, but instructors are welcome to have their own as makes sense. The thing that they couldn't do was like have their own policy about usage and then their own policy about like punishment or, you know, right. um, if, if the students didn't follow it, they still had to follow the institutional's, uh, the institutional approach on that. Mm -hmm. One of the other things, you know, the student, even before the students started to get into this, the temporary policy that I had created, I, th I think it allowed for up to either 25 or 30% of a work to be used by ChatGPT or, or whatever right. generative AI. Right. And that, right. that was intentional because, you know, if you forbid it, then you're never going to know if they're using mm -hmm. it. If you say you can use it, like then you can spark a conversation and, and ask, is that an effective use? Uh, right. And that way, like I, and this is the conversation I had to help guide the students is like, you know, if you think about it, it's very much like quotes. Uh, mm -hmm. You can use quotes in a paper and sometimes people use quotes like hand grenades. They just throw them out everywhere. <laughs> and like they fought, you know, they did what they were supposed to and use quotes, but they didn't use them effectively. So if we want them to be able to use this in, in smart ways, we've got to allow them to use it. And we have to like be able to give feedback on that. So the students really thought sure. about that. They really thought about that and, you know, realized that was important. Nice. Um, they also came up with in, and again, this is a guided discussion of like, okay, if we're not allowed to use it, then instructors shouldn't be allowed to use it. Right. Mm -hmm. There's a certain amount of parity of like, if you're telling me it's important for me to like do this entirely on my own, then there is, they're like, why do you get to use it to develop the course, right? right like, it was, right. so like there, there was some interesting um, ideas like that, that emerged. And yeah, I think I overall like there, yeah. And overall there was just this, this sense of like, we want to give space to allow for things that we are discovering. We, in this case, being the students, like that we're discovering are really helpful for us. And so we don't right. like, and we want the faculty to like both help us and also like, give us some guidance on like, when am I crossing that line, but not yeah. in a way that feels like, uh, that feels punitive without some preparation and meaningful discussion. Right. So right. I think the guidelines they set up are really structured in that way that students have a bit of freedom. They have responsibility there too. And it gives them some safety in the absence of an instructor having a policy, having something clear about it. So they feel like they can, they can lean upon. Absolutely.
It's that famous Spider-Man quote, quote, right? With right. great power comes great responsibility. And yep. I think this fits perfectly for that. And it's interesting that what you were saying, I really appreciate that, that I remember when, when website blocking was starting to happen in certain schools and certain mm -hmm. um, institutions. And our approach was always, why don't we get the kids to help us, you know, like let them try to break through, let us see where our weaknesses are and let's learn together rather than it be, you know, this one way street where it's coming from the top down. Let's get the roots, you know, of our students collaborating with us to figure out. Um, and oftentimes it would be great information, right. That they could, they could develop. So let's, I want to kind of do a little true false with you. Okay. Mm -hmm. I've, I've come up with a couple of true false statements and I'm going to throw them at you and we'll just see, We'll have your answers, okay? Oh boy, a test. Oh. I got I didn't. I didn't study. Let's see true how false. it goes. <laughs> right on. So, true or false? AI can accurately assess and measure complex skills like critical thinking and creativity. <sighs> Think about it. That. Um, that's a big one. It is. <laughs> it, like. The, yeah like in my head there's a there's a way i want to say it's true but there's all sorts mm -hmm. of like stipulations so true. like on face value without being any any ability to make any stipulations then i would lean towards false mm -hmm. but being able to both a first like get a working definition of those terms uh because they you know creativity means different things mm -hmm. and also with that is, um, and this is one of the things that I think about, like, and I've seen it with instructors who are, who are deep in love with their discipline and I get it. And they often like, they want all students to get to that ethereal range of love mm -hmm. for that discipline, you know? And, and I see this in arts of like, oh, they've got to like, they've got to do this. Like, and the truth is like, that may not be where the students want to go and like the, mm -hmm. there still may be creativity that they're doing even in collaboration with with these tools um so that's my stipulation is i, I think there the answer is you know false <laughs> however <Asterix>. i think <laughs> lots of lots of right lots of asterisks that are yep. about like really to what degree do we mean and to what degree do we need um right. yeah right. that's cool that's cool one more. AI can replace traditional teaching methods entirely in the future. I think that's true or false. The AI could replace, you know, physical teachers down the road. And we're just we're we're hypothetically speaking here, but what, what do you think about that? That because I do think like you were saying the fear, right? The of the mm -hmm. unknown. Mm -hmm. And that's a big question that people have when they're looking at this global picture of AI is are they gonna start replacing? Well, they've already started to replace people, right? In certain jobs and certain parts of 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 the structure of institution, but in education, which is a very touchy subject, right? Hmm. Can it replace it down the road? Do you think true or false? Um, I think overall, like I think if we're talking entire industry, I would say false. Mm -hmm. I, I think this will, I, where I see it, what I see it doing is first of all, upending our models, uh, like our understanding of learning through a right. scientific lens, because by and large, we don't use science to really unearth learning. And when we do, we come up with like, there's no, like there is no learning method that works 100% for everybody. And so it's often this like mixture, like the, the this, you know, often intentional, but still cobbled together different practices. Mm -hmm. And what I think we will see is, you know, a, we'll call it a learning bot for lack of a better word that is like, has the full context of the individual because they're on their device, they're connected to their wearable, what have you, that can actually measure where and how learning takes place because we mm. do formal learning in such a rigid 
way that is around convenience. It's around mm-hmm. like how many people can cram around the particular time in the particular place uh, mm-hmm. for this set of time that we've just decided amounts to the credit hour and, and all of that. Um, but that's not necessarily how people effectively learn. And so I think there's there's one portion of this where you know you're going to see much more customized or as they've said like personalized learning right right um, but i still believe there is additional communal learning that takes place there's you know some really interesting books coming out around like how much our learning and our understanding is like embodied both in our our physical body and in our surroundings and in mm-hmm. relation to people and so i think there's a there's those portions of learning that will be still need to be tapped and to be utilized for us to grow as like fully developed humans, whatever we mean by that. Right, right, um, right. So yeah, I, I would say right now false, but I do see their ways of it, of it working much more robustly. And I see mm-hmm. like, I see at some institutions, like this will be the, some of the large institutions that have like a hundred thousand plus students and like faculty Mm -hmm. basically get to grade papers and you know engage in discussion forums but nothing else like no like i will i see this as i see those institutions deciding okay well instead of now 20 students per class we can actually have 50 students per class because Mm -hmm. the ai can help the faculty member grade or give feedback or things like that um so i think we increasingly have less access to humans depending on the type of institution we're at. Sure. Sure. It's, it's tough too. Cause I mean, education has always been kind of industrial, right. In the sense that it hasn't shifted much in a century, I'd say, mm-hmm. I mean, I maybe a little bit, but the methods of how we convey knowledge and how students learn has mm-hmm. been relatively the same way for a, for a very long time. So it makes it tough for that unknown. Mm -hmm. Um, Interesting, interesting points. As we kind of get to a close here, Lance, and again, thanks for joining me. It's been really fun just kind of pontificating a bit and (laughs) tapping into your experience. But what, what makes an effective online personalized course for students because i know that you've done quite a bit with online and um creating kind of coursework for students what have you noticed that creates that engagement when a student is in you know just has a computer um for their learning Mm. um you know the the consistency is key uh this is something I, i work with lots of folks around is like you know making sure the things are there and they're happening at a consistent clip um, that nobody wants to come into week three and it's not there yet. Uh, like it, th- that idea of like the students should be able to know if they go in what to expect. And if not, that's going to continue to mean like, oh, why bother going in, which kind of builds off the like disengagement. I think really trying to work and it can happen for different, like different people can do it differently, but making sure there's that social presence, making sure the students know there's a human being involved. Uh, So the thing I will often do is in introductory discussions, I will do video responses to each student. Like I want them to know I'm like, I'm a human. I want them to hear my voice. I want them to like see my enthusiasm that they're there, like trying to make sure to to bridge that connection. Um, I think, trying to find ways for students to interact with one another that avoid the 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 very very stagnant discussion of post once reply twice to this thing Mm. um i took my first online class in like the summer of 2000 and the vast majority of discussion forums have not changed. Like most classes that I see are like, oh, post by Thursday, two replies by Sunday. <laughs> and it is the most mm-hmm. disengaging rote way. And so finding other ways. So what I've often recommended and done in my classes is like turning that into different things. I've turned it into doing things like annotating a text um, mm-hmm. so that like throwing something into Google Docs. And so people are reading it and now annotating and responding to one another. It feels Great. different. Uh, mm-hmm. I've done it where like for a two week period, they have like a, a, a dialogue buddy where they have to like talk twice in live space mm-hmm. that could be on the phone, that could be via Zoom to like talk about what they're learning and then generate like some some thoughts from that that they share with, with others. Uh, it's yeah. been things like blogging. It's been things like if you're going to do a discussion, like 
do role playing, like mm. come up with a scenario where they are different characters that have to like solve a challenge or that kind of project based learning. Um, so I think those are things that certainly help. The other thing is timely feedback. Uh, hmm. There's nothing like Great. if you're submitting something yeah. and you know you've gone in a week later and it's still not there, like you're gonna stop looking. Or Great. like I, I mean, I've seen and been in courses where it's been weeks, and like that's so demotivating. You're like, what do I even care? I don't even know how I'm doing. Like it's a Great. eight week course, we're halfway through. I've got nothing. Like <laughs> how am I supposed to be like caring about this? Or like I'm starting to worry, and that's creating a different feeling um, around the course that's not beneficial either. So those are kind sure. of like the, the big ticket items that I'm often working with faculty and they, they happen in different ways, but like really looking mm. at those. Yeah, that's cool. It's, it, it reminds me that you're bring, like, you got to bring the human in, right? right? Because it might be perceived as disengagement. You know, you're, you know, hundreds of miles away from me, I'm alone, but there are ways online. I mean, I've always said to teachers too. look at social media. Like, I mean, kids are all over that, right? That how could we leverage you know, that feeling or those mechanics of social media mm. into these online courses to, to keep that engagement going. But I love your idea of the timely feedback and, and that relation building. Um, I often think as, as a consultant that I'm, we're relationship builders, right? We just mm -hmm. try to connect with other people and, and advance, <laughs> you know, um, thought, um, yeah. pedagogy, uh, et cetera. So it's really quite fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's one other thing, and this is again, something I've been using in the last couple of years is like making sure assignments have a purpose. So I do a lot mm -hmm. around open pedagogy and the idea is like, they're not doing something that's just there to be graded or just be there to be thrown away, but has purpose is serving a larger opportunity. So like bigger projects in my course are often things that are going to be like put out into the public or their materials for future students. And so all, like always trying to make sure like, you're not just having them do the thing to do the thing, but it's tied to a bigger cause because that's another thing students are gonna want or be interested in or feel more excited about. And you know, that's true for face-to-face -face or online, but I think in online, you know, you're sending stuff into the void. You know, and so the idea that it's not just into the void, but it is actually going to have some life after the fact, is, I think it right. adds a level of, of uh, appreciation. Absolutely. I think that intent, which you're getting at the pedagogical intent, why, why mm -hmm. am I doing this? And you get that face to face a lot too, right? I'm thinking of my math class where I just was like, why am I, <laughs> why I don't understand, you know, like, I don't know how this connects to me mm -hmm. and furthering myself or furthering. Mm -hmm. So that disconnect um, has to be, you know, lessened for sure, for sure. And it's because like, uh, just the, like, it's so much easier to disengage in the mm. online space. Like when you have to show up, like there, there's certain decisions or flows that you just get into, but it, like, if, if you're just not feeling it, it's very easy not to go there. Like you can very easily ignore an online class in a way that a face-to-face -face doesn't feel the same. Absolutely. Yeah. It's so, so fascinating. Well, Lance, I, I, again, I want to thank you for your time today. Um, I know that as educators at the start of the year, time is precious, but it's been great to just spend uh, um, some minutes with you and kind of exploring your thoughts and ideas behind these pressing subjects that are in education that we're going to be dealing with again, uh, well, ongoing. Um, and I wish you a lot of uh, luck in your new school year. And um, thanks so much for joining me. Thank you, Chris. I really appreciate it. Nice. Let me just stop.